So good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for turning out this evening. Um, we're going to talk, first of all, about risk management, which is my passion, because risk management is the one thing we can do that really makes a difference between success and failure. So uh, if you, uh, you want to do anything important, it's got to be risk management. Um, I just, sorry? What have I? Switch your clicker over. Oh, yes, that would help, wouldn't it? <coughs> thank you. Um, so risk management is the thing that makes the difference between success and failure because we all plan to succeed and then we don't. And the reason that we don't always succeed is because things happen that we didn't plan for or that we didn't expect. And those things, if we had been able to see them and prepare ourselves and position ourselves better for them, we might have had a better chance to be more successful. And of course the things that we don't see and that aren't in the plan and sort of leap up and surprise us, actually those are risks. So risk management, if we get that right, is the thing that will make the difference between success and failure. And the thing that really annoys me about risk management is a lot of people say either it's really, really difficult, or it's really, really boring, or it actually doesn't work. And as far as I'm concerned, risk management is really easy because it's intuitive. It's what we do naturally in everyday life, we are crossing the street or thinking about bringing up our kids or investing our money. You know, we think about what might happen and what's the right, the best uh, course of action. So it's just easy because it's intuitive. Um, it's not, um, when people say it doesn't work, you know, maybe they're not quite doing it right. Uh, because from what I've seen, risk management is really simple and is really effective. And I want to share with you some ideas uh, this evening around where risk management is going. We've been managing risk for probably four or 5,000 years, ever since we've been trying to do organised things. Um, and you'd think we might have got it right by now, and surely there can't be anything new to learn about risk management. But I'd like to suggest to you that there are some new things that we can learn about risk management. Um, and so really this is a kind of starting where we are and looking a little bit further ahead into the future of where I think risk management is going. Uh, I've been doing risk management since about 1985 started uh, you know, when I was very, very young. Um, and um, uh, Risk Doctor and Partners is a global consultancy. Uh, we've got offices in Sydney, Johannesburg, Dubai, Taipei, um, where else, throughout Europe, Toronto, Los Angeles, and, and so on. Um, and so we basically work wherever there's risk, that's where we go, not just in the world of projects and programs, but also corporate and strategic risk, environmental, reputation, counter-terrorism, fraud, any of those kinds of areas, uh, if it's risky, we'll be involved in it. Um, so my focus uh, this evening is going to be on project risk management, but these principles and some of these ideas do apply more widely. And if you want to know more, um, then the website is a good place to look, and there's also a book which is related to some of the subjects we'll talk about this evening. <coughs> so let's get to uh, the material, and there are slides around, and I think they'll also be on a website if you want to download them uh, after the event in a PDF format. Uh, in terms of risk management for projects, uh, we've actually made quite good progress over the years. There are standards. There's an ISO standard. ISO 31000 came out in 2009. Uh, the PMBOK, the, if we're into PMI, the Project Management Body of Knowledge, um, Chapter 11. Uh, we've got um, other, other bodies of knowledge. There's other standards around. Um, we have our own Institute of Risk Management. There's an Institute of Operational Risk. There's an Institute of uh, Business Continuity. Lots of professional bodies. And we really know what we're doing. At least in theory, we know what we're doing. And the infrastructure is there in terms of tools and techniques and training and consultants and all of the things you might need to support you. Um, and people say maybe uh, risk management is already a profession. Uh, I'm not sure if that really is true. Um, sometimes people think that risk managers are just a bunch of cowboys who are trying to kind of scare you into giving, you the, giving them your money. You know? So if I say everything's going to go horribly wrong, but if you give me lots of money, it'll all be okay and then I'll tell you how to do risk management. Um, well, you know, we aren't really a bunch of cowboys. There is some science and some theory behind it. Often when you go to the, uh, the risk department or the risk management specialists, all you hear is this, you know, well, it's a nasty world out there. You need to be careful. Uh, and again, we can do a little bit better than that. It's not just about mind how you go uh, you know, and don't, uh, don't make any slips and trips. Um, there is a science, there is a discipline of risk management which has been developing for quite a long time and, as I say, which really works. So uh, in terms of risk management today, um, everybody knows when it comes to projects, projects are risky and so we need to manage risk on projects. And we pretty much know what we're doing in terms of the sort of techniques and, and tools and so on and processes. Um, so we've been doing it for a while and obviously everything's fine, isn't it? 
and we don't have any failed projects, and we don't have any problems with our businesses, and everything is just uh, under control. Well, here's uh, some data from the Standish Group, who have been monitoring project performance since 1994, uh, under these categories of succeeded in meeting all of their project objectives, failed by meeting none of their project objectives, or challenged in terms of meeting uh, most of them but missing in one or two. And you'll see that really over the last sort of 15 years, nothing much has changed. And we're still finding that, uh, you know, only a third of our projects succeed in every respect. So something's clearly going wrong. Project risk management is supposed to help. It's supposed to help because life's risky and projects are risky and we've got to do something about it. And risk management is our approach to doing that. Um, it gets us focused on our objectives because risks are the uncertainties that could affect our objectives and so it's always thinking about what we're trying to achieve and what might drive us away from that and that's a good thing to be focused on on the goal it's about looking ahead and being proactive and having a forward-looking radar to scan the future and say what's out there coming our way and and how do we prepare for it in the best possible way which ought to be a good thing it gives us some sort of thinking time so before the thing arrives and hits us we can prepare ourselves and look at the options and and have a considered response um, and it ought to make sure that we focus on the things that really matter in instead of just the urgent things that jump up in front of us. So really it ought to be helping. But things keep going wrong. So what's the problem? Is there a problem with risk management? Um, it, or is it the way we do it? Um, I'd like to suggest that there are three areas that we can improve our risk management in. The way that we think about risk, the way that we act towards risk, and the way that we think about the people side of risk management. And I'd like to suggest to you under these three headings some areas where we might make some simple incremental improvements that could make a really big difference to the outcome, the effectiveness of our ability to manage risk in our projects and programs. So let's think about principles. And I want to focus around these four key words, uncertainty, risk, threat and opportunity, and try and understand how they relate to each other. Um, we all think we know what risk means, but if we went round the room and I asked for some definitions or some ideas, I think we might be uh, surprised at the variety that we get. A lot of different sort of ideas and opinions and so on. Um, you know, maybe it's about, you know, feeling that the situation is big and threatening or that you're in a rather vulnerable place and it's all likely to go horribly wrong and have some big personal consequence. Um, well, I think we have different views of risk and that's not helpful. We should have some consensus around what risk really is because risk management manages risks. And if we don't know what a risk is, then we're not going to be able to do our risk management very well. So let's see if we can understand what a risk is. And I'd like to start with just asking this question. Are these two things the same? Is risk a synonym for uncertainty or is there some essential difference between the two? Well, you probably know that they're different because all risks are uncertain, but not all uncertainties are risks. There's a whole bunch of uncertainties that we don't care about. Uh, is it going to rain in Kazakhstan tomorrow afternoon? I don't know. You don't know. We don't care. It really doesn't matter. You know, what's the exchange rate between the ruble and the yen going to be in 2030? No idea. There might not even be a ruble in 2030. But uh, it's an uncertainty. It doesn't matter. So here's my way of distinguishing between risk and uncertainty. I use these three words as a filter. Risk is a subset of uncertainty. Risk is the uncertainty that matters. And that's really important. So that we, we have to know that anything that's not uncertain is not a risk. It might be a problem. It might be an issue. It might be a constraint or a requirement or something else. But it's not a risk if it's not uncertain. And if it doesn't matter, then it's not a risk to me either. But how do I know what matters? Well, what matters is anything that could affect my objectives. In projects and programs, in wider business, in life in general, we set objectives and goals. And what we're concerned about is the things that might affect those. So we're going to use that as a filter on the big world of uncertainty, all the millions of uncertainties that are out there, and try and work out which ones do we need to know about? Which ones do we need to prepare for? Which ones do we try to respond to proactively? We respond to the ones that matter. And actually, lots of things come from just these three words. And if you don't remember anything else from this evening, these, that, that's the thing to remember. Risk is uncertainty that matters. How do we know how big risks are? They have two dimensions. How uncertain are they? How much do they matter? So we have to think about probability and impact. 
You know, there, all sorts of things come from this. Different things matter to different people because they have different objectives. So we have hierarchical risk. We have strategic risk that matters to the people who own strategic objectives. We have technical risk to the people who own technical objectives. So we can get layers or levels of risk linked to our levels of objectives. Lots of things come from just this very simple first concept or principle. So risk is uncertainty that matters because it could affect objectives, which means that if we want a definition of risk, it has to include these two ideas of something uncertain and something to do with objectives. In the ISO standard, there's a nice simple statement. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And if we look in some of the other standards, like the Association for Project Management, the APM's body of knowledge, it says the same sort of thing with just rather a few more words. Uncertain event or set of circumstances, it could be one thing or a group of things coming together. The key characteristic is it's uncertain, and if it happens, it matters, because if it occurs, it will have an effect on achievement of our objectives. So you see we're bringing these two things together. But actually this begins to give us some sort of ideas around what we need to think about, what we need to include in our definition of risk and in our practice of risk. Because very often our view of the uncertainties that matter is quite limited. So we tend to think only about events, a thing that might happen or not happen. But risk is any uncertainty that could affect objectives. It's an uncertain event or set of circumstances. So there are other types of uncertainty that we need to include in our definition of risk that we need to think about when we're managing risk on our projects and programs. And it's not just in the APM definition. You'll find it, for example, in the PMBOK and elsewhere. So we should be looking for any uncertainty that matters, not just uncertain events, things in the future that might happen or might not. I'm going to give you some sort of technical words here, but don't worry about the technical words. It's just to give labels to the different types of uncertainty that we need to think about. Uncertain events we call stochastic. It's a Greek word. It just means it either happens or it doesn't. It's a kind of a binary yes, no, black, white, in, out, one, zero, stochastic kind of thing. So is our, is our key supplier going to go bust? Yes or no? We just don't know. You know, there's a probability that they will, a probability that they won't, but they either will or they won't. So will our, uh, another supplier deliver on time? Maybe, yes or no. It's stochastic. Okay? So that is one type of uncertainty that matters, but there are others. How about aleatoric? The word alia is Latin for dice. What it means is that a dice has six sides and it has one to six on it. So when you throw the dice, you know you're going to get a one, two, three, four, five, six. You just don't know which one. Okay, so we've got a range of possible results, but we don't know what the actual answer is going to be. So variability is when we say, I know I'm going to do something, I'm going to dig a hole, or I'm going to design a piece of software, or I'm going to you know, do a trial. I'm just not quite sure how long it will take, or how much it will cost, or how many people we'll need, or how many bugs we'll find, or how long it will take to rectify. So it's a planned activity with variable characteristics. That's a different kind of uncertainty. When we've got something we plan to do, and there are things, characteristics of it, that we're not sure about. It's different from whether the event will occur or not. So we're definitely going to do this trial. We're just not sure, quite sure how long it will take. OK, you see they're, they're different. How about this one, epistemic uncertainty? The uh, Greek word episteme means knowledge. This is about things that we're not sure about. We're not really sure what the requirement is. We're not sure when we go out to the site what we'll find when we start digging holes. The customer hasn't quite settled the contract, so we don't really know what the terms and conditions are going to be. This is about uncertainty in our knowledge, and it's something that needs to be resolved in a different way from uncertain events or from variable events. We need to find out. Either we know or we don't know, so we tackle it in a different way. And then here's one that you perhaps might not have heard of. Ontological uncertainty is about having some sort of blockage in your conceptual framework where there are things that you can't even think about, things that are outside your frame of reference that you couldn't imagine with all of the workshops, with all of the great facilitation, with all of the creativity techniques in the world, there are just things you could never think of because it's outside of your frame of reference. And these are the famous unknown unknowns, the things you don't know about. And they're important too, and we've got to have some way of dealing with them. 
Now, often you'll find that risk processes only think about events, things that will or won't happen. And we are missing a huge amount of uncertainty that matters. And in terms of growing our risk process and making it more effective, we really have to think about these other things. And we have to find a way of including them in our risk process so that we are understanding, identifying, assessing and managing these sorts of things too, variability, ambiguity and our blind spots and working out ways of actually dealing with them. It's, some, it's a way in which we need to develop the risk process to, to, to fill in a gap. And people are thinking about this and people are working towards it. So if your risk process only deals with uncertain events, you are missing <coughs> something. And there will be uncertainties and risks that you're exposed to that you're not looking at, that aren't in your risk register, that you're not preparing for, and you could be in trouble. Well, that's the sort of uncertainty that we need to think about. When we think about the uncertainty that matters, what sort of mattering should we include in our definition of risk? Of course, we tend to think about negative things, like this little chappy thinking about the trap. You know, obviously there are traps in our projects, like things that could waste time and waste money and destroy value and hurt people and damage reputation. All of those are bad things that we need to stop happening. They're uncertainties that matter because if they happen, they're bad for us. But in this little situation down here, there's another uncertainty as well as the trap. And it's this uncertainty here, can I get the cheese off the trap? And we also have in our projects positive uncertainties, things that might or might, might not happen, that if they did happen, we'd be pleased about. Things that would save time, save money, enhance performance, and enhance reputation. And those things matter too, and we should be looking for them. So the mouse here, to succeed, has to not be killed or injured. He mustn't spring the trap, and in our projects we must avoid the traps, of course. But he also has to get the cheese, and in our projects we also have to create value and create benefits and make sure that things go right, as well as stopping things from going wrong. So it's not just about protecting ourselves, it's about embracing and exploiting uncertainty as well in order to create value from it. So there are uncertainties with positive effects as well as uncertainties with negative effects. Both of these are important and both need to be managed. So if we think about uncertainties that matter, it's not just the bad uncertainties that matter. The good uncertainties matter too. So if I said to you, and you're my project sponsor and I'm the project manager, I've got a process that can create a list of all the things that might go wrong with our project and I'm going to work out what to do about it. Would you like to see that list? Yes, please, says Mr. Sponsor. And then you say, actually, my process does something else. It also is going to create a list of things that could happen that would save time and save money and make our project more successful and more efficient and increase our productivity. Would you like to see that list too? Yes, please, says Mr. Sponsor. These things matter. And of course, we want to be as effective and efficient as we can. So wouldn't it be good if we had a process that dealt with that. So uh, maybe, and of course what we want to do is to deal with it in the most efficient and effective way and there's always a better way and that's part of what we're talking about this evening. So in terms of definitions, what kind of effect matters? Now PMI has spotted this and actually right way back in 2000 when we had the 2000 edition of the Pinbot Guide, um, we worked out that we needed to think about cheese as well as traps. And so in our definition of risk in PMI, we have something which is very similar to APM, but something in here, we've added something about cheese and traps. Well, of course, we didn't actually say cheese and traps, but we said these words. A risk is an uncertain event or condition that if it happens, has a positive or negative effect on an objective. So we've got this idea that this unitary concept of risk has two sides, two flavors, an upside and a downside. And we call the upside risks opportunities, these are good risks, we want those, and the downside risks, the bad ones, we call them threats, but they're both risks, which means that risk management <coughs> should deal with them. So it's not just PMI having some sort of weird brainstorm, you know, uh, or some seizure where it's all gone horribly uh, off track. Uh, the um, ISO standard says the same, effect could be positive or negative, and APM in their normal wordy way, says the same thing with lots of words, positively or negatively. So here's an interesting concept as well. 
risk is uncertainty that matters. We need to expand our view of uncertainty away from just events. But we need to expand our view of what matters as well away from just bad things to include good things as also. They both matter. So now let's just think about one other expansion to our concept or principles of risk. And I hope I'm not blowing your mind too much here, um, but here's an interesting thought that you might like to think about. What's the difference between risk and risks? Now you might say, oh, don't be silly, that's just singular and plural. Well, let me explain. What happens if your project sponsor asks you the question, how risky is your project? The answer is not a list of risks. You can't answer this question by listing the risks in the risk register or by showing a heat map that has some reds and yellows and greens in it. This is something different. This is about risk, the risk of the project, not the risks in the project. And there's a difference between overall risk and individual risks. Does that make sense to you? So what we've got is a concept that says there's something else in addition to the sum of the individual risks which is different, which reflects the riskiness of the project. And we really need to know the answer to this question, as well as the answer to this question, of course. This is the risk register. What's this? What is this thing called overall <coughs> project risk or, or riskiness? And how do we describe it? Well, APM and PMI have been thinking about this for quite some time. In the new APM body of knowledge, there's a definition. Overall risk is the exposure of stakeholders to the consequences of variation in outcome. It's about what comes out of my project. And the PMI practice standard for project risk management says pretty much the same thing. The effect of uncertainty on the project as a whole. It's more than the sum of the individual risks. It's something else. It's some other concept. The project, risk, the project manager needs to be able to answer this question. <coughs> So we have to know how risky is my project. What is the risk level? High, medium and low, one, two, three, four, five, does that do it? You know, <coughs> what sort of units do we use? How do we describe this? We do need to have some language, some techniques, some process to enable us to handle this level of risk. It's a valid part of managing the risk of the project. And I think this is an area that most of us as project people haven't really thought about. We know there's a question there somewhere and we're kind of reaching towards it with our risk process and our risk registers, but we haven't really got a way to answer this. Actually, it's in the PMI practice standard for project risk management. We did think about it in 2009 when we wrote that. And the APM in the new body of knowledge has also addressed it. And there are some quite good guidelines for addressing overall project risk. Here's one way to think about it, which is my preferred way. And that's to say there's two types of risk management that we can engage in. I call them implicit and explicit. You might call them something else. What I mean is that when you're setting up a project, the decisions you make about the structure and scope and context and content of the project are decisions that will determine the level of overall risk in that project. What are the objectives? What are the resources we're going to apply? What are the constraints? What are the priorities? What are the assumptions? Those things will determine how risky the project is when we set it up. And then we can have an explicit process that we're used to uh, identifying, assessing, <coughs> responding and so on, which deals with the individual risks that are in the project. And I think we find this at all sorts of levels. We might do this at the programme level. The content of the programme, the structure of the programme, defines the overall programme risk exposure, and then we manage the risks within the programme, the risks of the component projects and other activities, which give us a, a, a way of managing those individual risks. We can do it at corporate level or at departmental level. The way we set it up gives it an implicit level of risk, and then the way that we manage or execute it deals with the individual risks at that level. These are different things. And if we want to manage risk in our projects effectively, we need to be able to do both. Okay, well, I hope I haven't completely blown your mind. And you might have thought you knew what risk was. Uh, maybe there's some new ideas here. If risk is any uncertainty that matters, that includes anything that we don't know about that could affect our objectives. Uncertain events, you might remember the word stochastic or you might not. Variability in our planned events, we call that aleatoric or things that we're not sure about, epistemic, ambiguity, 
or things that we haven't even thought of, that we haven't conceived, our ontological blind spots. Any uncertainty that matters. And looking for good ones as well as bad ones. All of these things that matter need to be managed. And the overall riskiness of the project. So the challenge for us, as we're looking to make our project risk management better, more effective, looking at more of the uncertainties that matter, giving our projects a better chance of succeeding, is to address all of these things. And this is the challenge for us. Is this how we conceive of risk? Is this in our conceptual framework? When we talk about risk, do we talk about these things? Or do we just talk about events that might or might not occur? And I think to be world class, to be leading edge, to be really best, best in best practice, we need to be thinking about some of these things as well. And so I would ask the question, if you don't do this, why not? And think about what you could do and maybe what you should do to address those things. Okay? Now, we'll have a chance to talk about some of those things later on, if you like. But let me move on to my second area, which is process. Now, processes are boring, aren't they? But we do have to have processes. And the problem with processes is they're a bit like this. We know where we start and we know where we finish. And there's a kind of process in the middle where we kind of hope it all works out. And risk management is a bit like that. You know, this is our standard risk process. This is the one we've got from the PMBOK that we in PMI all love and have memorised and we know. And we know it really well, don't we? And most of you will have some, uh, some pro risk process in your organisation that looks a bit like this. And we're so familiar with it that we don't see what's wrong with it. There are at least two things wrong with that process. And yet, you know, we're going, no, no, and that's been in the PMBOK for like forever. Sure, there can't be anything wrong with that. You set up your objectives and you define the scope, then you find the risks. They're not all the same, so we prioritise them and put it in the risk register. We have some optional modelling step that we might do to look at the overall risk exposure. <laughs> then we decide what to do and do it. OK, um, so what's the problem? Anybody see any problems with that process? I'd like to suggest that there are two. The first, well, let's go back, is uh, what happens between here and here? So it says here, you plan responses and then you monitor your risks. Anything wrong there? I think the problem is, in between planning and monitoring, it doesn't actually say, do anything. And that often happens in our risk process. All the time I come across people who have a risk workshop, you know, facilitated by some expert person like Penny, and then they get a nice long list of risks, and then they decide what they're going to do about it and put it in the risk register. Then they put the risk register on the shelf or in the drawer and get on with their real work. And then a month later they come back for a risk review. Oh yes, must look at this risk register and see what's here. And of course nothing's changed or more likely it's got worse. Because, and the worst thing about that is you think you're managing the risk because you've got this nice document and you're not doing anything. It's a real problem. You might know this little riddle and I'll just ask it to illustrate the problem. Um, if you've heard it, well, you've heard it. Um, it goes like this. There are five frogs sitting on a log and four decide to jump off. So how many frogs are on the log? The answer is five because they just decided. Exactly. And that's the problem. So we go right the way through our risk process and decide what we could do. We could jump this way with this risk and jump that way with that risk. And then we sit on the log saying, great, finished. And we haven't done anything. So what we've got to do is take the action that we plan to take. And that means looking at the way risks have changed with our risk reviews, seeing if the responses have worked and if not doing something else, and monitoring the overall effectiveness of the process. You know, we've got to get the frogs off the log. You've got to jump. Otherwise, it's just analysis, which doesn't change anything. You've got to do something, right? It's about risk management, not risk analysis. It's risk management. So we've got to do something. And the problem is the process doesn't say that. Well, here's the process that does. Three cheers for APM, and John will be cheering in the back, back uh, over there. The APM process has this step in it. Implement the responses. So you come through here and you make your plan and you can't do anything else till you've done it. And then you review and manage the process and go back and update it and so on. I think that's great. And just because it's not in the PMBOK doesn't mean that we can't put it in our own processes. There's nothing to say you can't add something to the PMBOK. So I would recommend that as a minimum step. Put something in your risk process that says do something once you've planned it. So that's the first problem with the risk process. 
is there anything wrong with this process? You know, this is what we do, isn't it? You sort of set it up and then you identify and assess, plan, do something, and then you monitor and then maybe identify some new ones and prioritise those and plan for them. What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? And round we go, and round we go, and round. Does your project go on forever? No. Does this process go on forever? Yes. Where's the end of this process? It doesn't have an end. And our risk processes don't ever end. You look in the pin box and it just goes on forever. Surely not. Um, projects have an end, so we ought to have an end to our risk process. When we get to the end of the project, we ought to do something about closing out and learning lessons, making sure that we don't make the same mistakes twice, not just um, you know, going round and round forever, which it appears to do. So we need to have some sort of terminal risk lessons learned step, which might be built into our post-project review if we do those, and quite often we don't do those either, uh, might be part of our knowledge management process if we have one of those, but again, often it doesn't happen. And there we are left without a proper conclusion to the risk process. So I would say let's have some sort of risk lessons learned review at the end of our risk process. Let's put that extra box in that says round and round and round till the project finishes, then we stop. And then we look and see what we learn. We learn what sort of risks keep coming up, what sort of responses work, how much does risk management cost, and what does it do for us? And then we build that into our future process so that we learn. It's really important. And here's a process where you've got all the normal stuff and reviews that go around and implementation, of course, and a post-project review. This is the ATOM risk process, active threat and opportunity management. Uh, it's a process that I developed with a colleague and we've published books about it and there's a website for it. But here's, it's quite novel to actually have a terminal step in the risk process. I think it's obvious and we ought to do that, otherwise we're just going to carry on. So I'd suggest in terms of process, and I've gone through this quite quickly because I think it's simple, um, that there's two things we forget to, to do in the process. One is implement our responses and the other is stop and learn the risk lessons at the end. And we really need to do that and our processes are deficient if we don't do that. So, does your risk process have those steps? And if not, why not? And what are you going to do about it? These are simple changes to make and I would really recommend that you do them now, straight away. Go back to the office tomorrow and rewrite your process and put two boxes in implement the responses and learn the lessons at the end. Easy, right? Why wouldn't you? Okay, one more area that I'd like to focus on quickly where we need to learn to do something different. And that's the area of people. You see, we started off, let's say 30 years ago, thinking that processes managed risk. And we learned that from the oil and gas industry where you know, they were doing all this in the North Sea we learned it a bit from the aerospace when they were learning about Polaris and missiles and that sort of thing, that we need to sort of have a process to deal with this uncertainty. But processes don't manage risk, and neither do computers or tools and techniques. People manage risk. And people are very complicated. We have all sorts of stuff that goes on inside us, in our heads and in our guts when we're faced with uncertainty, that affects our behaviour, that affects our decision making. And if we don't think about that, then it's going to lead to a process which is not effective. Here's a little simple suggestion. There's a lot of talk about culture and particularly about risk culture these days, especially post the global financial crisis. How do we get there? A poor risk culture. Where does culture come from? Culture comes from repeated behaviour. But where does behaviour come from? Behaviour comes from the way that we think. Attitudes produce behaviour and behaviour, when it's repeated, builds culture. And these things are equally true of risk. So if we want a risk mature culture, it starts with the way we think about risk, our risk attitudes. Risk attitudes are really important contributors to the effectiveness of the risk process on our projects and elsewhere. You know what CSF means? It means that if we understand this part, it's a critical success factor that will make our process more effective. If we can see where people are coming from, understand the psychology of our decision makers, make better decisions that take account of bias, then our process will be more effective. What happens if we don't understand this, if we rely on process alone? If we think, you know, people are just like rational machines, you poke them with some input, they do some sort of processing and the output comes out. It's as reliable as anything. If you ignore this, is it neutral? Well, I don't think so. I think CSF could mean something else. 
It could mean a critical source of failure. If we don't get this right, if we have people who are reacting with all sorts of biases and feelings and things driving them that we can't see, and they're making decisions about risk which are not properly based, then our process is not going to be effective because it's based on poor judgment or biased judgment. So we do need to understand this. People do all of the important parts of the risk process. We decide how much risk is acceptable, we find out what the risks are and how big they are and what we're going to do about it. All of these things are affected by the way we think about risk. If we think risk is horrible and nasty and we need to avoid it at all costs and it makes us nervous and we retreat away from it, we want to protect ourselves, we'll have a very different response than if we actually think risk is quite interesting and quite exciting and quite challenging and I want to get involved and see what I can do about this risk and prove myself and test myself against it and that's why I come to work is to deal with the risk. Now if you have that view that risk is fantastically exciting, you'll have a very different response and all of these things will be different than if you think risk is frightening. So it matters. We need to understand it. People respond to risk in a range of different ways and we call this the risk attitude spectrum. Some people don't like risk and some people do. And there are different sort of strengths of reaction. So if we have the same risky situation, let's say you're about to start a new project that you've no experience of before and a new client and a very uncertain requirement and, 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 some people are going to be scared stiff and run a mile. And some people faced with that will say, oh, this sounds quite interesting, let's have a go. And others will just say, yeah, that's just my job. They don't have any kind of strong reaction. And you'll see this is a continuous variable, that in the same risky situation, different people react in different ways. There's no right or wrong answer as to what you know, the right place to be is, but we have all these possible choices of where we might be. Uh, we actually divide this into areas just to help us talk about it. So if you get people who say, oh no, I don't really like risk, or ah, this is horrible, take it away, that's what we call risk averse. Where you have people who say, oh, risk, well, that's quite interesting, or fantastic, bring it on, the more the better, that's what we call risk-seeking. And then there are the people who just say, oh, yeah, risk, that's kind of normal, goes with every project, it's part of my job, just deal with that. That's what we call risk-tolerant. Now, the question we have to answer is, where am I on this spectrum? And where should I be? And if you think about it for more than five seconds, you'll realise that the answer is, well, it depends. Where am I depends on the situation I'm in and what I'm trying to achieve. And where I should be depends on what my objectives are and what's the right thing for that situation. Because we could be at any one of these places depending on what we're trying to do. So sometimes project managers need to be quite adventurous and step outside the box and try something different and be innovative. And sometimes they need to be very, very careful. And sometimes they just do their job. So we have to move around on here. If we ask the question, where are you? It depends. It depends on what I'm trying to do and how I feel about it. And where I should be also depends on the objectives I'm trying to meet. You see, risk attitude is variable. You don't always have, it's not just, I'm here, this is me, that's where I, you know, that's just the way I am. You could be in different places, which means that if you know that, you could choose to be in a different place instead of just happening to be there. We could do this in a managed or intentional way. How could we do that? Well, one suggestion is um, a, a process I've developed with a friend of mine called Ruth Murray Webster. We call it the six A's model. It's based on emotional literacy, literacy or emotional intelligence. And it starts the way that all emotional things do, which is with awareness. What's going on? But this is not awareness of emotions, it's awareness of the way I'm thinking about risk, my kind of gut level reaction. And not just awareness, but appreciation. So what's going on and why? And how is my attitude affecting my behaviour and what culture is that developing? And also, not just for me, but for my team. What's the shared attitude to risk of my project team? Or of my project board? Or of my stakeholder community? Or of my customer? And what behaviour is that producing? And is that helpful? So first question, what's going on? Then we ask the next question, is this okay? Is this helping us or not helping us? It might be that the risk attitude that we naturally adopt is unhelpful, in which case we need to do something about it. And here we have some more emotional intelligence words. We can assert the need for change and change. 
and there are obviously things, techniques behind each of these, these different uh, keywords. But it might be that our gut reaction is okay, and having worked out where we are and what's going on, we say, actually, that's fine, and we can just accept our natural response to the uncertainty and go with that. And of course we have to make sure that it st stays okay, the situation will change, the risks will change, we might need to adopt a different attitude. So this is a sort of ongoing cyclic process. But here what we're saying is for me as an individual, for myself, and for my team that I'm responsible to lead, and for my stakeholder network, I should be asking these questions. Where am I and where are we? What sort of attitudes to risk have we adopted and is this okay? And if not, do I need to do something about it? and being proactive about it. People manage risk, and our attitudes affect the effectiveness of the process and how well we're going to do it. You need to know that there's something going on here. You know, it's not just uh, the process, it's the people too. Once you're aware that there's something going on, you need to know what it is. And once you've understood it, you need to do something about it. This is really important. And for most of us, we don't think about this. We just kind of take people at face value, we kind of let things happen, and we don't really manage the people side actively. Why not? And could we? And should we? In terms of best practice leading edge risk management, this is where it's going. And in terms of the title, you know, what's new about project risk management, this is new. We don't do this very well. You don't see this in the PMBOK. You don't see it really in the ISO standard. It's just kind of on the edges but it's really important and it's coming. Okay, well I've pretty much run out of time, so let me just have a few final thoughts. Project risk management is too important not to do well. And we're not doing it very well because our projects are still failing and our businesses are still failing and we're still struggling with things that we shouldn't be. So we need to do something better. Something better about the way we think about risk, the way we act towards risk and the way we take account of the people side. I think we need some people like this. You know, too many of us just settle for the way we've been told it should be, for the way we've been trained in the training course, for the way the organisational process kind of works. And we just say, well, it's not very good, is it? But hey, who am I? What can I do about it? Well, we need pioneers and we need rebels. People are going to go out there like Davy Crockett into the wild frontier to places that have never been before, are going to break new ground, are going to say, I'm going to go this way, does anybody want to follow me? And actually do new things. Try something different. If you've never run an opportunity workshop with your project team to look for upside risk, why not do it? Oh, well, it's not in the process. Yeah, so? Be a pioneer. Try something new. Or how about this? How about being a rebel and breaking some rules? Why not? How is anybody ever going to make any progress in managing risk better on our projects if we don't break the rules and do something differently? Somebody's got to do it. I'm doing it in my little place, in my little way, and our company are leading other people to do it. But you've got to do it too. We need a kind of grassroots revolution in making risk management more effective. And you're the one who can make a change. Let's have some quotes. Uh, Einstein said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know, is risk management working for you? If not, do something different. Otherwise, it's just going to be the same. What he meant to say, I think, this is my version of what I think he was trying to say, is that it's, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And if that's not good enough, you need to do something different. And who's going to do all this new stuff? Well, there's this wonderful quote from Gandhi, much broader than just the world of risk management or projects, but he said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. You've got to do it. Nobody else is in your, your position. You can change things and influence things that nobody else can change. There is a better way of doing this, and I recommend that we have a go. And we try some of these new things. Risk management is too important not to do well. And these things are simple changes, they're incremental changes, building on what we already know. And if we do some of them, they will make a big difference. I really recommend it to you. Um, let me just close by saying there's a book, uh, Managing Risk in Projects, which covers all of these areas in more detail. Um, there's a leaflet on your tables which gives you a 35% discount. And I've got some copies here that I can sell uh, to you at a discount as well if you're interested in taking one with you. So thanks for your attention. Uh, I think I'm done and pretty much on time. Uh, so I think we'll have questions later on. Is that how it's going to work, Penny? Yes, that's how we're going to do it. Good. All right. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.